I, if I were home, my, uh, my students would be at talks too for extra credit. So. <laughs> anyway, let, let's hope this is uh, you enjoy this. <laughs> I think you will. Anyway, well, what, what I'm going to talk about, uh, since uh, you apparently have a sizable number of folks who are interested in areas of science and technology, is uh, is something called quantitative or probabilistic risk assessment. It's a technique that's been widely used in the United States, but also in some of the more developed countries like the Netherlands and Germany, for example. And uh, it's a technique that uh, has been mandated by the Congress ever since the 1982 Risk Assessment Research and Demonstration Act. That's the way we make our decisions about what sorts of risks we as a society are going to accept from nuclear power plants to liquefied natural gas facilities to toxic waste dumps or whatever. And what I'd like to do to get you to begin thinking about technological risk assessment is to suggest something to you about these statistics. <coughs> Probably most of you don't know that the US Office of Technology Assessment, again, a government group, not the Sierra Club or not the local wing of the Socialist Party or something, but the U.S. Office of Technology Assessment estimates that probably 90% of cancers are environmentally induced and theoretically preventable. That's an incredible statistic. Roughly 29% of those cancers come from cigarette smoking. I like to say that because uh, I've seen a lot of smokers around here. <laughs> anyway, I don't see as many smokers in Florida unless they're over 70. But um, most of those cancers are environmentally induced and theoretically preventable. So if you look around the room, what you should do is think that roughly one in three of you is going to have cancer, premature cancers. And you know from what's up there that uh, cancer is a leading cause of death of young people. It's not just something that's associated with the aging process. So we are literally killing ourselves. And what I find amazing about some of the ways that we're killing ourselves is that there are 40 to 50,000 murders every year in the United States. There are many more deaths uh, that the government estimates are caused by air pollution, many more deaths caused by cancer. And yet we don't call those deaths murder, do we? And yet, 90% of the cancers we think are environmentally induced and theoretically preventable. So that suggests to me that we need to think, perhaps, in some new ways um, about what we're doing to ourselves and um, how we define what we call technological risk. Maybe how we define even things that uh, that, that we might call uh, that we might call murder. Now you all, when you hear the term probabilistic or quantitative risk assessment, you probably think of the area in which quantitative or probabilistic risk assessment arose. It began to be done in the 1950s when various countries went into nuclear generation of electricity. And the problem was that countries um, could not find adequate liability insurance when they went into nuclear generation of electricity, so the government did quantitative risk assessments in order to determine just how risky nuclear energy was. And that's the way the, the technique got its start. I'll tell you in a few minutes what things are included in the process known as probabilistic or quantitative risk assessment. But most of it got its start in an attempt of the, the government, mainly the US government, to figure out exactly what the risks were of nuclear generation of electricity. Because in 1955, before the nu first nuclear plant was online in the United States, every um, company in the United States concerned with or working with nuclear energy refused to go into commercial ge generation of nuclear electricity because the company said it would be too risky. The accidents could be catastrophic and uh, too many people could die and the companies would never survive. They'd go bankrupt in the event of an accident. So the government began doing probabilistic risk assessment and developing techniques for measuring different societal risks. This particular slide, as the bottom of it shows, is the slide of Chernobyl. This is one of our more celebrated technological risks. 
the people that have probably died or will die within the next 30 years as a consequence of Chernobyl probably will number about 40 to 50,000. That's simply using the dose response curves. That is the, the, what we know about the amount of radiation that was emitted. And then using uh, our standard tables used by the National Academy of Sciences to estimate how many deaths will come from that level of radiation exposure. We've had a number of other technological uh, catastrophes in addition to nuclear power, but I use the nuclear case simply because the failures of nuclear power are so dramatic. The U.S. government itself says that if there were a catastrophic core melt, roughly 145,000 people would die, an area the size of Pennsylvania would be wiped out, property damage alone would be about $17 billion. Now it's important to point out that the, um, the liability consequences, the health and medical losses expect to, expected to occur, would be about three to four times that 17 billion, and that the government guaranteed liability limit in order to protect the nuclear industry is roughly 1% of what the government says could be the total possible losses. So we have some serious problems. We have a technology, many dangerous technologies, but this one in particular, for example, has caused accidents, or could cause accidents, which on the government's own admission are not insurable. By U.S. law, the Price-Anderson Act, roughly 99% of the losses given a catastrophic nuclear accident would be uninsurable. That is to protect the nuclear industry. We also have some problems with risk. I'm going to give you just an overview of risks to try to interest you in some of these problems because I suspect that most of you didn't know that your losses would not be covered in the event of a, of a catastrophic core melt. Our space problem is also very, very risky. Anybody who's looked at any of the risk assessments uh, that have to do with the, the whole NASA enterprise would never be surprised at the Challenger disaster. If you look at the, at the failed launches and the successful launches, you'll see that the probability of failure, at least in terms of the actual frequency of failure, is very, very high. So who should have been surprised by a Challenger disaster? Not only these sort of exotic technologies, but virtually every worker in the United States, every blue-collar worker in the United States, is exposed to workplace risk. And I have lots of tables on uh, the sorts of workers in particular occupations and the sorts of cancers that are associated with their, their workplace. But I didn't want to bore you by showing all of them uh, to you. You're in an area of very high pesticide use. And I can tell you that there are a lot of pesticide-induced cancers. That may be one of the worst hazards uh, in Iowa. So all of us, uh, all of us, it's safe to say, are exposed to hundreds, perhaps thousands of risks in our daily life. And we have to come up with a decision about what risks we're going to accept, how we're going to distribute those risks, who's going to pay for the cost of reducing those risks. And that's a serious health problem, again. That's why I gave you the, uh, the, the, the numbers at the beginning on murders. So I submit to you that the problem of how we manage technological risk is no less serious a problem than how we handle murder. And the U.S. is the murder capital of the world. So that should give you some idea of how serious our problems are with technological risk assessment. We're talking roughly about, in the ballpark, of half a million cancers a year, half a million cancer deaths, with 90% of them environmentally induced. So you see that's an order of magnitude greater than murders, but you don't hear people yelling about environmentally induced cancers as much as you hear people yelling about murder. Well, with that sort of background, if I haven't scared you enough or worried you enough, I caused you to say that you're not going to smoke any longer or uh, stay downwind when people are spraying pesticides or whatever, <laughs> then listen for a few moments because uh, that's what I'd like to uh, convince you to do. Let me tell you a little bit about risk, though. Risk is a philosophical topic because it has to do with 
an ethical issue. How great a, uh, a threat to our welfare is too great. The way people define risk, however, is not explicitly ethical. This is the way that government risk assessors typically define risk. Compound measure of perceived probability and the magnitude of adverse, adverse effect. So in other words, somebody would say, well, you know, I spray Roundup to get rid of weeds. What is the increment or the increase in my average annual probability of fatality as a result of my spraying Roundup? Now the government's goal is to assess all of the risks to which we as a society are faced, particularly the risk that we don't choose ourselves, risks from societal factors that are difficult to avoid, and then figure out what risk to control on the basis of what their probability is and how many fatalities or deaths they likely cause. So typically risk assessors will talk in terms of the average annual probability of fatality. So every day you're exposed to hundreds of factors, every one of which contributes to your average annual probability of fatality. Now, one reason why risk assessment is important, again, is that if the government is going to spend money to reduce risk, presumably it makes sense to reduce the most serious or the highest probability risks first. At least if you're a proponent of economic efficiency, that makes sense. Right now, we spend about $5 million in pollution control for every steel worker's life that is saved but there are many other areas of our health care, areas that have to do with the health of women and children, for example, in which we spend ten, twenty, or thirty thousand dollars for regulations or health programs uh, to save uh, to save a particular life. So there's a real question of equity here. Once we know the probability of fatality associated with a particular risk, okay, then how do we decide? when to impose pollution control regulations, or when to attempt to save those lives. And as you might suspect, the lives that are most often saved are those of fat, middle-aged, wealthy males. Surprise! And the, and, and the sorts of things that bother them. There's a lot of research on heart disease, for example. People who tend to be unionized have a lot of money spent on that. So this is one more area in which we need to talk about questions of ethics and social and political philosophy. Now, typically we say that a risk is worth <coughs> taking if it gives us a lot of benefits, because most of our models for looking at whether risk is acceptable are straightforward models of neoclassical economics. So we figure out how much money is spent in a particular risk, for instance, with respect to uh, skiing. What's the total amount of money that American consumers spend on skiing per year? And then we write that down as a benefit. And this particular curve shows the risk as graphed against the particular benefit that comes from the number of activities. You'll see that handguns out up there cause a lot of risk to a lot of people, okay? Have a very high probability of doing a lot of damage and yet, they apparently contribute very little to our benefits in terms of economics, unless you have grounds other than economic ones for doing in your neighborhood with a handgun. Okay, but that gives some idea of one of the ways in which we like to look about at risk. We rank them in order of probability of fatality, or we rank them in order of benefits. Now, you may say that it doesn't make sense to use probabilistic risk assessment, but it does, in large part, because if we don't use some form of analytic technique to figure out what our probability of fatality is and how much it costs us to save individual lives, then we'll spend money very inefficiently. Let me give you an example. One of the most effective ways of saving lives uh, that are normally lost through automobile accidents is through use of seat belts and airbags. What you pay per life lost is very, very cheap. One of the most inefficient ways to save lives uh, that are normally lost 
through automobile accidents is through driver education. It's simply not effective. You know, you pull millions and millions and millions of dollars into driver ed, and um, there's substantially no difference between the people who have the benefit of driver ed and the people uh, who don't, on the whole. I know that you get lower in, uh, insurance rates if you've had driver ed when you're a teenager, but nevertheless, the cost per life saved is astronomical compared to the cost of simply installing seat belts or, uh, or airbags. So one of the reasons why we want to look at the most efficient ways of saving lives is that obviously we can save a lot more lives with the same dollar if we try to evaluate our risk in terms of probability of fatality and at least make that one consideration. Now when people, typically economists, epidemiologists, uh, some statisticians, some engineers, when they typically do probabilistic risk assessment, usually what they do is, is three sorts of things. First of all, they identify a risk, usually using epidemiological methods. They might notice, for example, that people in a particular industry tend to have a certain type of death or a certain type of cancer. Uh, at the second stage of risk assessment, Typically what people do is two things in estimating the risk. They try to get what we call a dose-response curve. They try to figure out through animal studies, for example, given a certain level of exposure, what level of injuries or fatalities will result. So for every hazard that is known, we try to come up with a dose-response curve that tells us, given X level of exposure, you're going to have Y level of response in terms of injuries or fatalities. They also try to figure out what the population, who the population is that is at risk from a particular exposure to a hazardous substance. Finally, they attempt to evaluate, and it's this third stage where usually the work of economists comes in. They try to evaluate, given a world in which there are thousands of risks, which risk we should spend taxpayer money to control. Okay, and they do this often through methods of benefit cost analysis by, by using things like that risk benefit curve that I just showed you. How many benefits do you get from this particular risk? What's the probability of fatality? Now the magnitude of this task might not be clear to you until you begin to think just about chemicals in this country. Every year in manufacturing processes alone, not including agriculture, just manufacturing. Every year we use 60,000 chemicals in the United States. Roughly 10,000 of those chemicals are new each year. And most of them have not, have not been tested using sophisticated epidemiological methods. So there's a massive problem of what risk to control, and there's a massive problem of trying to determine what level of risk is acceptable. When you hear the number 60,000, pretty soon you can figure out why 90% of us are pro who die of cancer are probably dying from preventable cancers that are environmentally induced. Okay, with that sort of overview of, uh, of risk assessment, let me just quickly tell you a little bit about each stage. This is what people do at the identification stage, if they're epidemiologists, to figure out what things cause us harm. They use case clusters, they compare compounds via structural toxicology, they look at the chemical properties, for example, and assume that if something is a carcinogen and has roughly the same structure as another chemical, then likely the other chemical is a carcinogen too. They perform mutagenicity assays, in other words, assays, they try to determine what the genetic effects of, uh, of particular chemicals will, will be, chemicals, for example. They use long-term animal bioassays and they extrapolate on the basis of animal experiments to what happens with humans. Another thing they do is use biostatistical epidemiological surveys. They look at a population of human beings who are exposed and they try to figure out what's happening to them and why it's happening. <coughs> at the second stage, risk estimation, this again is where people attempt to get a dose-response curve, they attempt to figure out the population at risk, and they attempt to estimate the dose that's received by the population. At the third stage, the main, the, four, the third stage, 
risk evaluation, where we decide which risks we want to regulate, which ones we want to control. What we attempt to do primarily is use methods of economic efficiency. The second two methods have to do with uh, psychometric surveys. We simply look at what people's preferences are, either as they've revealed them in the past or as they express them in the present through any, any survey mechanism. The fourth technique of evaluating which risks are acceptable and which are unacceptable is the so-called method of natural standards. And that, that method, in a nutshell, is simply to assume that if the pollution or the harm that is caused by a particular substance, chemical, or whatever, causes fatalities that are of the same order of magnitude that we believe existed in the past, then we can go on contributing that order of magnitude of fatalities. In other words, they look at the natural background level of some pollutant. Take radiation, for example. All of us are exposed to about 170 milligrams of radiation every year. What they typically say is industry or anyone can contribute roughly that order of magnitude of pollution, okay? because it will cause roughly the same number of fatalities that are already being induced naturally. Okay? So they assume ethically that what is natural is okay. And as long as what we do to ourselves is on the same level as what nature does to us, we're okay. Philosopher G.E. Moore wrote a lot about what was wrong with arguments like that, and I'm not going not gonna to go into that. But um, at least you can see that all of those methods have some obvious problems. Now this is the traffic example that uh, I talked to you about before, the cost per fatality for stall. And this gives one of the best reasons for using some method of risk assessment. Namely, <coughs> you can save a lot more lives more cheaply if you have at least some data about the economic efficiency that's associated with using particular techniques of controlling risk. You see up there that mandatory seatbelt usage is a very inexpensive way to, uh, to save lives. You see down here that driver improvement is a very inexpensive, is a very inefficient, very expensive way to attempt to save lives. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the things that are wrong with probabilistic risk assessment. Obviously, I've given you the overview for why we need risk assessment. If we have roughly 100,000 dangerous things in our lives, chemicals, other substances, dangerous to which we are exposed day in and day out, if those things threaten our welfare, our very continued existence, then obviously we need some techniques for figuring out how we're going to regulate those risks. Otherwise, we're going to be subject simply to the uncertainties of the political process and whatever lobbyist or industry has the most money to impose his risk on us. So obviously, we need some form, it seems to me, of probabilistic or analytic risk assessment because there are too many risks and we can't deal with them all through some kind of populist method of voting on what we want and what we don't want. So, highly complex area of technology. But the difficulty with probabilistic risk assessment is that there are a number of typical flaws. And what I'm going to do very, very quickly tonight is talk about some of the reasons why I think we still face large risk. Talk about some of the reasons why our cancer rate is still going up. Talk about some of the reasons why probabilistic risk assessment has failed to protect us adequately, even though we began using it roughly in the 1950s. And with each of those flaws in probabilistic risk assessment, unlike some philosophers, I'm going to try to suggest some solutions. And I think policy has to be practical if you're going to talk about uh, real world problems. Well, one of the difficulties with probabilistic risk assessment is that is that assessors are often wrong in the scientific <coughs> models that they use. This is a picture of a nuclear waste dump that I talked about this afternoon. It's a dump in Kentucky. It's called Maxi Flats. The people who predicted 
how long it would take the radionuclides in this dump to migrate off site. And there was a lot of plutonium there. There still is a lot of plutonium there. The people who predicted how long it would take that, those radionuclides to migrate off site were wrong in their predictions by six orders of magnitude. That's a big mistake. Six orders of magnitude. Probabilistic risk assessments uh, typically vary anywhere from three to six orders of magnitude. In other words, if you pull in a couple of hundred probabilistic risk assessors, epidemiologists, economists, statisticians, their answers about a given what the given risks are because of the uncertainties in the modeling will typically vary among themselves okay, by three to six orders of magnitude. So here we have massive risk and massive uncertainties. Okay? So that's one fundamental problem. Another difficulty <coughs> is not only that the predictions are wrong, as they were at Maxi Flats, okay, not only that uh, risk assessors contradict each other, this slide indicates one of those contradictions. In California, near where I used to live, there was a huge liquefied natural gas facility. That's a very dangerous installation because at certain uh, percentages of concentrations in the air, that liquefied natural gas is explosive. So you have stuff in the air that explodes. And when people tried to estimate, uh, when they tried to estimate the average annual probability of fatality associated with living near a liquefied natural gas facility here in coastal California, those predictions uh, at similar facilities throughout the world using similar technology varied by a factor of 100 million. Now what this should tell you is that the typical orders of uncertainty in probabilistic risk assessment are very great. And that's perhaps one of the first and most, most monumental problems. The actual studies contradict each other. So our first problem is that the experts are often wrong, the technical analyses are poor. Okay, that's a big problem. A second difficulty in probabilistic risk assessment that I believe is, continues to be life-threatening is that risk assessors don't pay attention to what I call methodological value judgments, something that philosophers of science and people who do epistemology worry about all the time. I'm going to give you some examples of the way they don't pay attention to methodological value judgments that render their conclusions highly uncertain or wrong. A third thing that they do is they use questionable decision theoretic rules. Even if they use the correct data, there's so much variation in the rules that they use to interpret the data, the rules out of decision theory. I don't know how many of you know what decision theory is, but um, I'll, I'll try quickly to give an example of that. A fourth problem with probabilistic risk assessment, and probably I should spend the most time talking about that, is that people fail to take account of ethical dilemmas that are generated by probabilistic risk assessment, so that the people who most frequently die as a consequence of societal hazards are the people who, for centuries, in virtually any society, have been the very folks who've been disenfranchised and hurt in a variety of other ways, okay? So there are a number of ethical difficulties. Quickly let me go through uh, some of these uh, difficulties and then I'll spend some time talking about the fourth because the first three in my example of them might be, <coughs> might be too technical to, uh, to interest some of you. Let me just give you this quick example. It's a quick and dirty, crude example that shows you why it's so difficult to do an accurate probabilistic risk assessment. This shows you, in a very, very crude way, what's going on in the radiation case. Typically what happens is you have a data point where you know how much radiation was released. Say in Hiroshima, or at Chernobyl, or at Three Mile Island. In truth, we're not too sure about Three Mile Island, but I don't want to go into all that. But say we have a data point at Hiroshima, and we know how much radiation was released, and we have some idea of the injuries and fatalities that resulted 
at that dose of, of radiation. The difficulty is that lower, at lower levels of exposure, we're really not sure what the curve looks like. And again, this is a gross oversimplification because there are 30 or 40 competing curves. But in a nutshell, the industry people will typically say, oh, you know, you don't really get any deaths or injuries till you have a really high risk. There's a threshold. There's a threshold for risk, and you don't see those fatalities occurring until you get up to a really high threshold. And of course, you don't do experiments on human beings, so you can't settle these arguments. Typically, environmentalists will use a curve that looks something like this and say, "Ah, oh, don't don't be uh, you know don't be misled by the dose response curve that we pull out of Hiroshima. Really, at lower levels, there's lots of evidence that all things being equal, the low level exposures are even worse. Okay, and then typically, this is true of most." disputes over toxic substances or hazardous substances or, or any sort of societal risk that we face, typically the professional associations will end up somewhere in between what the industry people say and what the environmentalists say. And short of experiments on humans, there's virtually no way to resolve the dispute. Okay? So even using conservative dose response curves, typically the ones of the professional associations, which are the same ones that the government uses, we can still say 90% of us will die of occupationally induced cancer, of environmentally induced cancers, but uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the data. So that gives you some idea in a very graphic way of why we get into modeling problems with probabilistic risk assessment. Now with that sort of crude <coughs> example done, let me give you some idea of the ethical difficulties that we face in probabilistic risk assessment. I don't like to say there's the good guys on one side and there's the bad guys on the other side. I prefer to say there are a lot of ethical dilemmas. And these dilemmas, in many ways, are, are unsolvable. Uh, and I'm not sure that it always helps to think about the good guys and the, uh, and, and the bad guys, because often the very people who want pollution are the very people who want the jobs or the money or the whatever associated with it. And you can't always rely on the people themselves to lower their levels of pollution. So it's not a simple problem of the people versus industry. If life were that simple, our problems would be easier. Rather, I think, many of the ethical problems, which I'm going to focus on tonight, are really dilemmas, not in a logical sense, but in the sense that there are no easy solutions, like tell industry to stop polluting something like that. The solutions just aren't that easy. One big dilemma is what I call the consent dilemma. And this is, this is something that we've, we've never dealt with as a society. And we in the United States have more of a problem in this particular ethical area than probably almost any other nation, except perhaps developing nations. The consent dilemma is this. We say presumably, that we're allowed to impose a risk on another person only after that other person gives consent. If you go to your doctor and your doctor experiments on you without your consent, you would all say that's wrong, right? So presumably, <coughs> you only take on a risk after you have consented to that risk. And that's a, that's a belief about which there's virtually no controversy. Imposition of risk is legitimate only after consent is obtained from the affected parties. People don't have a right to do something to you for their own gain without getting your consent first if what they're doing is threatening you. Okay. Now, presumably, we all believe that. But the difficulty with probabilistic risk assessment is that typically the people who are genuinely able to give free, informed consent to a risk are precisely those who are unlikely to do so. Let me give you an example. Who do you think are the people who work in very, very dangerous industries, sloshing around vinyl chloride for Bia Goodrich, making pesticides for Dow or Monsanto? Who do you think are the people who do that? Sociologically speaking, they're people who are uneducated, they're people who have no other job opportunities, so their freedom to get another job is lacking. 
So already, they don't have much information, they don't have much freedom to get another job. If they could get a better job, and they knew what the risks were, they wouldn't be working there in the first place. Sociologists and economists have both established that as education goes up, and as job mobility and training go up, risky occupations go down. So, the only people capable of giving genuinely free, informed consent to a risk, well-educated, free, occupationally mobile people, are precisely the people who don't consent to the risk. And yet the very people in our society who take most of the risk, the worst risk, are precisely the people who, in principle, <coughs> cannot give free informed consent to the risk. That is a dilemma. Those who can ethically take on the risk don't. And the very ones who are una unable, in terms of ethical conditions, okay, to accept the risk, are precisely the ones who bear it in this society. Now, you, you can see that most graphically in terms of occupational risk, but you can also see it in terms of areas of the country. Think of any depressed area of the country, and think for a few moments about what area of the country is likely to accept a toxic waste dump. Or where in a community do people usually put the city dumps? Do they put them in the high rent district? Hmm? No. You better believe they don't. They don't put any noxious societal facilities where people have money, power, or education. So you typically find hazardous, dangerous, or undesirable facilities being cited, S-I-T-E-D, cited in precisely the area where the people don't know what's going on and probably don't ever give free informed consent to it. So again, you've got the dilemma. The people able to give consent don't the people who are unable to give consent are the ones that we say give it. Now this goes back, this doctrine of the consent dilemma <clears throat> has been sort of pushed aside in the United States and our worries about consent have been pushed aside because we all have subscribed to the neoclassical economic paradigm. Following Adam Smith, we all believe that people who are in risky occupations, just to use this example, people who are in risky occupations can accept those risky jobs because there is what we call, and these are Adam Smith's words, a compensating wage differential. All things being equal, if you're a coal miner, you have the same level of it as somebody else, you know, who just pushes the broom, you're going to make more money as a coal miner because there's, a, there's an increment or an increase in your wages for the risk that you bear. And Adam Smith claimed that there was a compensating wage differential, and that was the reason why you could justify the additional risk that's imposed on certain members of the workforce and imposed on certain segments of our society. The compensating wage is a compensation for lack of consent and for the increased mortality. Now what's interesting about that uh, is that if you look at the economic data, you'll see the risk premium there. In other words, for every increment in your average annual probability fatality, for every increase of one in a thousand that you're going to die as a consequence of this occupation, this is, in current dollars, the way your salary goes up. Okay? So for every increment in risk, say the neoclassical economist, okay, every increment in risk, your salary goes up. And that's the way they get around the compensating wage differential. A similar thing happens in a locale when you have a poor community that takes a toxic waste dump. They claim that that community receives certain economic benefits, jobs or whatever, and that compensates them for their risk. Now what's especially poignant about this consent dilemma and the ethical ramifications of it are, once you take the so-called compensating wage differential and you start looking at economist studies, just as a philosopher of science looking at their methods, okay? Once you start looking at the so-called compensating wage differential and you disaggregate the data, what you discover is that there's one whole segment of society that does make more money for the risk that they bear. And those people are 
white, male, unionized, and highly educated. That's the curve at the top, the, the people in the so-called primary segment. So you disaggregate the white, male, unionized, well-educated people, and you see, sure enough, there's a compensating wage differential. On the other hand, you see the people at the bottom, the people in that secondary segment, which tend to be black or minority, female, non-unionized, and not well-educated, and there is no compensating wage differential. So what's the upshot? There's a very clear consent dilemma in terms of the way we distribute our societal risk. And neither Adam Smith nor his descendants in neoclassical economics can tell us that currently we compensate for that ethical deficiency. Because when you see the way the data is disaggregated, we really don't uh, compensate. Let me move to another dilemma, the so-called contributors uh, dilemma. This dilemma occurs because all of us are subject day in and day out to numerous small risks hundreds of thousands of numerous small risks. Now the government sets pollution control standards and regulates hazards and says that, you know, below a certain level we don't worry about hazards, which is a reasonable thing to do. But the difficulty is, at least in the case of carcinogens, the aggregate of all those risks, each of which is alleged to be harmless because it's small, the aggregate, when combined synergistically, for example, or cumulatively, the aggregate is harmful. That's where those 90% of people dying from environmentally induced cancers come from. In other words, you may breathe a little bit of automobile exhaust, a little bit of pesticides, you may have a little bit of chlorine in your drinking water. You shove together all those kinds of things, and together they constitute an extreme health hazard, although singly they might not. So how do we get around the dilemma, okay, that we need to say certain small risks are acceptable because we don't live in a zero risk society, <coughs> and yet the aggregate of those numerous small risks is clearly not acceptable. What do we do? You see the problem if you think of this example that uh, Glover, Jonathan Glover, an Oxford philosopher, gave in one of his, in one of his books. He said, he didn't use it for this, I'm, I'm using his example for this case, but the example fits. It's as if, uh, he said, you're, you're given two separate uh, situations, and these are the situations uh, that I'd like to use to illustrate the contributor's dilemma. Suppose, said Glover, that you have a tribe of 100 armed bandits, they a attack a village of 100 unarmed tribesmen, and each of the bandits takes a lunch from each of the 100 unarmed tribesmen. So you'd say that's clearly morally wrong. The bandits have stolen the lunches. It's wrong to steal people's lunches, and that's obviously wrong. But what happens in the second situation of Glover's example is what I think is like what happens in our situation with risk in our society. You have the 100 armed bandits. They come into the village where there are a hundred unarmed tribesmen. And instead of one bandit each taking one lunch, instead they get in the big line, like a receiving line at a wedding or something. They get in the big, the big line. And each one of the bandits takes, say, one bean out of a bowl that contains a hundred baked beans. And each unarmed villager has a bowl that contains a hundred baked beans. So they go through the line and each bandit just takes one baked bean out of each of a hundred bowls. The net effect is the same. The villagers don't have any lunch, right? But it's very difficult to say that it's wrong to take one baked bean from somebody, right? That's exactly the situation that we face with respect to the contributor's dilemma. And it's not clear that we're regulating or taking account of this in any sense. Let me move quickly then to the third dilemma. And this is probably one of the most problematic of all, all of the uh, dilemmas. This is, this is the one that's most difficult to solve, and it's this. Obviously, we have to declare some threshold for the acceptability of a risk, because we can't live in society at all. Even a low-tech 
soft technology society without some level of risk. So obviously we have to declare some level of risk that we say is acceptable, that we say we're just going to put up with, right? But the difficulty is, once we declare some level of risk as acceptable, and in the United States, that level of risk is 10 to the, the average annual probability 10 to the negative 6. So the, the whatever uh, an activity is must contribute less than 10 to the negative 6 to your <coughs> average annual probability of fatality. In other words, whatever the activity is, driving your car, living next to a dam, uh, whatever, whatever the activity is, it must contribute less than a one in a million